Good afternoon. My name is Ian Robinson. I'm the president of LEO, and I'm going to be making a presentation uh, that is the background to LEO's uh, salary counter proposals that uh, were originally introduced uh, along with a version of this presentation um, last Friday, April 16th. So I'm going to screen share and run through these slides here. So our first slide is establishing that lecturers are critical to the University of Mich Michigan's teaching mission. And what you can see here is a comparison of the three campuses using a measure called student credit hours. We think this is the most accurate way to measure um, the level of teaching done by any particular kind of faculty. If I teach a course that is a three credit course, it means we meet uh, for three hours in a classroom uh, with students, whether in a lecture or seminar, seminar format. And if I have a hundred students in that class, then that's three hours per week times a hundred students is 300 credit hours per week. So that's how these comparisons work. If you look at Ann Arbor in the fall of 20, you see that for all student credit hours, including graduate students, uh, lectures accounted for just a little over a third of all student credit hours taught that term. If we look at just the undergraduate student credit hours, the number goes up to almost 39%. And if we just look at undergrad student credit hours teaching in the first two years of the undergraduate program, the number is over 44% for lectures. In Ann Arbor, a lot of teaching is also done by our brothers and sisters in GEO, the Graduate Union. If we added them together with our own student credit hours, it would be well over half of all student credit hours for undergrads in general, never mind first and second year. In Dearborn and Flint, where we don't have very many graduate students, essentially lectures do the teaching that in Ann Arbor would done, be done by lectures and grad students combined uh, is all done by lectures. So in Dearborn, you can see uh, for all classes, 40 over almost 45%. By the time we get to undergraduates, well over half. And by the time we get to first and second year undergrads, over two thirds of all student credit hours are done by lectures. Similar story for Flint, numbers are actually a little bit higher in every category. So let me move to the second slide. Just as lectures are critical to teaching, teaching in turn is critical to the funding of U of M operations. Teaching has always been central to U of M's mission, of course, in terms of as an institution. Uh, but beginning in the 1970s, really, uh, a trend, well, and really you can trace it back to 1960, the trend line is pretty, pretty continuous. The funding share <clears throat> that go, of, of the total revenues of the university uh, that come from tuition has risen from 20% back in 1960, all the way out to over 70%, probably just under 75% by the time we get to the present. At the same time, the share of total university revenues coming from the state uh, in terms of transfers to universities has fallen kind of in mirror image of, of each other. So what that means is teaching and the revenues that come in from teaching is an ever more important source of the total operating budget of the University of Michigan. And in this next slide, we zero in a little bit more on the general fund component of the overall budget. And uh, the general fund basically is where all of the money from tuition goes, all of the money from the state transfers to each campus of the U of M goes, into their respective campus general fund budgets, and also any overhead that's charged on external research grants. Um, so that's what they call cost recovery here, the purple one, state funding here, but you can see 73.4%, the yellow here, is the revenue to the general fund budget that comes from uh, teaching, basically. Um, and all of the money to pay staff on the academic side of U of M, leaving aside uh, Michigan Medicine, is coming out of <clears throat> this general fund budget. Um, so lecturers, tenure track faculty, GSIs, all of us are paid out of this as our staff cleaning or so on. 
So this is the main budget uh, of the University of Michigan that's relevant to the academic side of our mission. And you can see just how important teaching is to that. Now, if we were to look at the equivalent pie chart for Clinton Dearborn, we would see that the teaching component was even higher uh, than it is for Ann Arbor because the state only funds Clinton Dearborn at about half the level per full-time student that it funds U of M Ann Arbor owing to their system for calculating uh, how much they transfer to each campus and each university within Michigan. And similarly, there is a lot less um, money coming in from overhead charged on external research grants. So teaching is an even larger share on those two campuses. And so we next wanna look at the net revenues from lectures teaching. And by net revenues, we mean the difference between how much money we bring in calculated by looking at the number of student credit hours that are taught and then the average uh, number of dollars that are paid in tuition per student credit hour. And if you multiply those two things, you figure out how many millions of dollars are brought in through the teaching that lectures perform. And if we look at Ann Arbor here, you can see that that number is about 421 million in the year that we looked at 2019, the most recent year we had data available for when we produced this slide. And then the yellow bar is total compensation. And that means the cost of all salaries of all lecturers in Ann Arbor and the cost of all benefits that those lecturers get, whatever healthcare benefits they have, whatever retirement benefits they have, and all the other benefits that um, a company being an employee at U of M are, are fact turned into a dollar value and factored into this. So you can see that total compensation for Ann Arbor campus was about 76 million in 2019. Um, Dearborn and Flint are much, much smaller campuses, far fewer students, so both bars are a lot lower. But if you think about the ratio between them, it's about four to one here in Dearborn and pretty close to four to one in Flint, uh, not very different from uh, Ann Arbor. Here's, here's what happens if you aggregate the three campuses together. Uh, you know, we don't really want to claim that all of the dollars that are earned through teaching are exclusively due to the work of Leo lectures. Uh, we know that it takes uh, workers in the classroom, cleaning the classrooms to make uh, those, that classroom environment work. We know somebody's got to be keeping the lights on and the heat working. There are skilled trades workers who are doing that work. Um, staff and others are supporting in various ways. So we don't want to exaggerate and say we're the only ones contributing to raising this money. But we do want to stress that you know, we play a vital role in doing the work that makes it possible for the University of Michigan to operate. And the gap between what we're paid and the amount of money that is you know, brought into the university through teaching is substantial. And, has, and this is after the 2018 contract that where we made major gains. Prior to that contract, these yellow bars relative to the blue ones would have been even lower. So we next want to move to the question of minimum salaries in other universities comparable to our own. And what we've done here is pulled together a lot of universities that have collective agreements for lectures. In the most recent year we could find on average around 2020, but you can see the specific years for each contract on the right hand column here. What you can see is a couple of really important things. First, at the top of the table, the, the, the highest paid minimum salaries for full-time employees, so FTR means full-time rate, the rate you're paid if you're employed full-time. All three of them, the University of California, which has multiple campuses, of course, Fordham University, which has three, and Rutgers University, which has three, have a system-wide minimum. This has been one of our demands in this round of bargaining. Um, the university has Administration has been very resistant to this demand, but other major universities have already done this. Um, there's a fourth down here, Penn State, also has a system-wide minimum. So if those universities can do it, we see absolutely no reason that the University of Michigan can't have a system-wide minimum as well. Fairness, equity, there are a lot of reasons for, for, for having such a minimum that is system-wide. And we've made the case in other contexts for why um, that is appropriate here as well. 
also want to note that University of Michigan is at the very bottom of this league table. All of these universities are paying more in terms of their minimum, whether it's system-wide or not, considerably more than Ann Arbor. Uh, Penn State's pretty close, but every, every, all the others are significantly above it. You know, half of them are at least $8,000 per FTR higher. And then, you know, U of M, Flint, and Dearborn are just another 10000 below that. So there's a huge gap there. UMass system, the University of Massachusetts system, has four campuses. They don't have a system-wide minimum, but it's worth observing that the variation among their campuses from the flagship at Amherst at the high end to the low end in, in uh, Lowell and Boston is about 90% of the highest. And in Flint and Dearborn relative to Ann Arbor, the gap is, is larger, it's 80%, and that's face value. It's actually worse than that if you understand what the next slide lays out. And that is that in Ann Arbor, although there are a few exceptions, School of Social Work being one, the norm, the overwhelming norm is that you teach three courses per term for two terms in order to be considered full-time. So you're teaching six courses in order to be paid at least 51,000 a year. In University of Michigan, Dearborn and Flint, on the other hand, the norm is four courses per term for two terms. So a total of eight courses to be considered full-time. And for that, you get 41,000. So if we just compare 41 to 51, we get the 80% number that I mentioned a moment ago on the other slide. But if we look at paper course, taking into account the fact that you teach two more courses per year in order to be considered full-time, then in fact, Flint and Dearborn faculty are being paid 10,000, at least 10,000 a year or less in order to teach more. Um, so that there, that it's only 60% of the Ann Arbor paper course, if you look at it that way. Now, you could say, all right, uh, well, maybe they're teaching more courses, but maybe they're putting in the same number of hours. I can tell you that teaching an extra course to meet the quality standards that we as professionals try to uphold means that we end up working more to teach an extra course. We don't just adjust and reduce the quality of the courses by 25% because we take on an extra course we put in the extra hours to try at least to hold, to, to, to maintain quality levels for all of our courses. Uh, if it were the case that people can't, they simply don't have enough time to do four courses per term with the level of professional quality that they would want. Well, that's not a good scenario either. It may not mean that we're working an extra, you know, 25% hours, but it means that the students taking those courses are getting that much less hours of faculty time per course contributed to them, thereby exacerbating the inequalities in the treatment of our students. So it doesn't really matter which scenario is true that the Flint faculty are working that much harder or the Flint students are getting that much less faculty time per course. Neither scenario is good or fair to the students or the faculty. Let's look at a few more comparisons here beyond the ones that uh, we've done with other four-year universities. Here we're looking at community colleges located in the same county as our, our three campuses are for U of M. So in the case of Ann, Ann Arbor's campus, that would be in Washtenaw County, the Washtenaw Community College. It has a minimum for its full-time faculty of 60,000 dollars of, of almost 10,000 more than U of M or almost 18% higher. Uh, Dearborn, the, the comparison there is Henry Ford Community College or right next door to the Dearborn campus. And they make a distinction that the uh, Washtenaw Community College does not between whether or not their faculty have as a highest degree an MA or a PhD. And if it's an MA, then they get the 48 thousand if it's a PhD 55 and, and something. So the gap varies depending on what, uh, what the highest degree of the faculty is. Now in the case of uh, U of M lecturers, we don't actually have precise data on how many faculty are in each of these categories uh, at the present time, but the last time we tried to calculate it, it broke out to be about 50-50 and the trend is towards a greater share of PhDs over time. 
So you could look at these numbers and say for maybe half of the Dearborn faculty uh, lectures, the gap is 18% and for the other half, it's 35%. And the same story with Flint, it's Mott Community College in Genesee County. And the numbers a little bit, the gap is ra rather smaller uh, for MA, but for those with PhDs, it's, um, it's actually pretty close to the Dearborn gap. Um, so really, really substantial gaps here. And that would be, I think, um, bad enough, we would say. Um, it's, it's not an accident that when a Mott job opened in chemistry in Flint, every member, every lecturer in the Flint chemistry department applied for that job. I mean, think about what that implies for faculty turnover and for the cost of high faculty turnover and that is not a good thing for our students or for our faculty or for the units that they teach in. Yeah, that would be bad enough, but there's a second aspect to this, which the slide doesn't represent, but which I'm just going to speak to. And that is the rate at which um, pay increases. So these are the, it affect the starting pay for the community colleges and for um, lectures. I did a calculation of the, schedule that's used um, for the Mott Community College full-time faculty. And if you start with a master's, the lower one, so that would be Mott is in Flint, so that's the 45,000. Um, they have a step system and each, each year you go up by a certain percentage based on these steps. By the end of step five, so five years after being hired at Mott, you would, you would have gone from 45,000 900 to 59,560. Um, by contrast, if you were a Leo lecturer starting at 51, five years in, and let's assume um, they don't, we don't have a step system in our contract, but an average in annual increase for lectures in over, over in recent years uh, would have been 2.5% annual increase. So let's suppose that was what happened for the first four years. And then in the fifth year after their major review, they got a 7% and they passed, let's assume they got a 7% increase plus the 2.5 for that year for a total of 9.5% increase in that fifth year. That would still get them uh, to 48,000 um, uh, from the 41 that they began at. So overall, the gap the, the, the um, University of Michigan Flint faculty member that started at 41 in, has a 18% increase five years into their uh, service for U of M and their counterpart at Mott down the street um, has a 30% increase. That's how much slower, it's almost, almost half as fast in terms of building from that base at U of M as it is in uh, Mott Community College. So, all right, all that is about minimums and it's a reasonable question to say, okay, people start there, but if they you know, progress from there relatively quickly, maybe um, it's more important to look at median salaries than at minimums or maybe not more important, but it's important to look at medians as well. So that's what this next slide does. Here you can see that we've created three bars, one for each campus. And at the top of the bar is the median salary for uh, all lectures on each of the three campuses. So you can see, yes, the, the, the minimum in Ann Arbor was 51 and the median is 11, almost $12,000 above that. Flint and Dearborn though are not very far above the median. The median recall was 41. There are only a, a couple of thousand dollars above that median, uh, even though the average number of years of service for lecturers at the University of Michigan is probably around eight years at this point. Again, there are people well, well above that, but that's the average. The median numbers ought to, median and average are not the same concept, but they should be fairly uh, reflective of, if the average lecture has been there for eight years, that should be reflected in the median. These medians, uh, considering how many years uh, lectures tend to be at University of Michigan are not very far above the minimums, but there's a second and I think even more important way of thinking of sort of gauging, well, is that a reasonable median to have for lecturers and or not? And, and that is, let's look at these medians, comparing them to the cost of living. 
for each of the three counties in which our campuses are located. So we're fortunate that in the last few years, the United Ways of Michigan have been producing what in, initially they called it a basic needs budget. And then more recently in the, in, the, in the 2019 update of this, they changed the title to a household survival budget. I think that is actually pretty accurate characterization of what they're doing in this budget, because as you can see here, they look at monthly costs for a set of basic needs housing, childcare, they look at different configurations of family here, you can see in the columns. So that if a single adult, there is no childcare, senior, one adult, no childcare. But if, if you've got two adults and one infant or two infants here in this permutation, then they calculate childcare, food, transportation, healthcare, technology, a small miscellaneous, not very much money in that, taxes, and then a monthly total from which they then calculate an annual total. So using this method, this is a very stripped down survival budget in the sense that it saves nothing. There's no money set aside for your retirement. There's no money set aside for your kid's college education. Really uh, no money for vacations or, you know, maybe there's a little bit of money for going out and eating in a restaurant, but look at these numbers, 260, well, let's look at the two adults, two children, 800, less than $800 per month you won't be having many restaurant meals on that price. Look at the cost that they've set aside for housing, $779. This is a Michigan average. Anybody in Ann Arbor who can find an apartment or a house or a flat for $779 that would accommodate two adults and two children, uh, you found a, a real bargain because that is extremely rare. So these numbers are actually kind of lowballing it, at least as regards uh, Ann Arbor costs. Fortunately, recognizing that there's quite a lot of variation within the state of Michigan in the cost of living, the United Way calculations look at each county uh, and break it down. So we'll be able to look at calculations I'm going to look at next. We'll look to adults and both kids in school, which will actually generate somewhat lower costs than this because there's if your kids are both in school, there's, there's a much less childcare expenditure required than if you're dealing childcare or one adult staying out of the labor market partially or completely in order to look after the infant and the preschooler. So we could have used higher numbers, but we thought we'd be conservative in that regard. You can see that if we use this particular permutation, even with this stripped down minimalist survival budget, month to month getting by budget, with those four people, you need $64,000 and change to, to meet your week, monthly bills. All right, now let's look at um, the same kind of calculation, but we'll look at, uh, instead of a state average, we'll look at it with uh, the county averages. So this is Washtenaw County. The cost of living is a little bit higher. Instead of 64, it's up to 66, 576. For a, a somewhat less expensive family configuration, two adults and two children that are already both in school. The same configuration in Dearborn is a little bit lower than Ann Arbor, 61,272 is the, what's required. And Flint does have a lower cost of living, it's 53,436 for them. However, when you look at these bars and you say, well, what share of all lecturers, if they were working full time at the full time rates they're being paid at, would earn enough? to be above that survival budget line as defined by the United Ways. Over half of our Ann Arbor lectures, 54.4% would be below that threshold. And if we looked at Dearborn, even though their cost of living is a little lower, because their full-time rate is so much lower, it's 86.4% of the Dearborn lectures who are below the threshold appropriate to Dearborn. And then in Flint, because their cost of living is substantially lower, uh, the share that's below the threshold is a little bit lower than Dearborn, but still, you know, 70, over 70%. And this is if every single one of these lectures was working full time. A lot of them are not. And so they, they may be getting income from teaching somewhere else or from doing something else somewhere else, but they're actually earning less money from U of M than what these bars imply, which of course implies that unless they've got extra sources of income from somewhere else, the bars would be even higher if we took that into account. 
Uh, the next slide looks at a different kind of comparison. We're not comparing lecture full-time rates against um, a baseline of what other colleges or community, community colleges or universities do. Instead, we're comparing them internally with the kind of salary that upper administration in our university make. And for the purposes of this graph, we defined upper administration to mean administration officials who are paid at least $100,000 a year as their, as their basic salary. So you can see we've gone all the way back to 2005 here. And you can see that the, and this is looking at medians again. So you can see the median salary for lecturers over that time period uh, started at a little below 40,000 um, and then um, grew to uh, a, a maybe 50, uh, 55, something in that order. These um, numbers have not been inflation adjusted. So this curve would be even flatter if we took into account the effect of inflation on uh, the real purchasing power of these dollars. We could recalculate it that way, but this is uh, nominal dollars. So, you know, the overall picture that you get from this graph, I think is pretty, pretty clear. There is a vast gulf, a threefold gulf at least, between uh, the two uh, uh, groups of uh, U of M employees. That, that gulf was narrowed somewhat in the 2018 collective agreement, the one where we made a major gain in our first in the first year of it when the minimums rose significantly from what they had historically been to the levels you saw in the earlier slides, 41,000 in Flint and Dearborn and 51,000 in Ann Arbor. So this slope between uh, 2017 and 2018, that, that reflects the kicking in of that significant increase in the MINS and a corresponding increase for long serving uh, lectures as well. Um, uh, then you see it kind of the slope of the line gets, gets less sharp, uh, meaning that the increases are not as big in the, in the last two years of the previous contract. There isn't an equivalent rate of increase um, in, the, in the median pay of upper administration but that can be a little deceptive. Let's look at the next slide. Here we zero in on the top 300 administrators in this category. And we see that there the slope is, a, there is a, a very substantial increase every single year of these 15 years. And really, if you compare the slope of our best year, 2017, 18, with the slope of the line of the 300 top administrators, for them, every year is like our best year, every one of these 15 years. And so, although some have suggested that the rate of Leo's increase in the last collective agreement was somehow too high, uh, or perhaps okay for one time, but not as a general rule, maybe we should look at what's going on with our top administrators. Here's another way of looking at what's going on. Now we're not looking at median salaries, we're looking at the total amount spent on these two categories of U of M employee. So we're back to looking at all of the admin, higher admin people defined as those earning at least $100,000 a year and all of the lecturers. And how much is being spent on each one? How fast is that amount increasing? So you can see that it's increasing very fast for all of these top admin, uh, administrators. And at a much slower pace, again, here's that one year, 2017-18, where the pace picks up a little bit and looks a little bit more like the line that's the, the constant 15-year line for these um, higher administration officials. Um, it's worth noting that over this period of time, a lot of the higher rate of increase is not due to, although it's true for the 300 that their higher rate of that, that their salaries were increasing a lot more rapidly than lecturers' salaries were. Most of the divergence between these two lines is, in fact, not due to that, but it's due to the fact that the number of people in this higher admin category was growing much more quickly. So 
the fact that more people are coming in and crossing the $100,000 threshold keeps pulling the median for the whole group down. But the overall amount of money you're spending on this category of administrator is growing rapidly because the number of people crossing that $100,000 threshold is growing quite rapidly. And just to give some sense of how rapidly, I'll give you uh, in information on the last three years, basically 2017 to 2020. In that period of time, the number of people in this category, $100,000 or above doing administrative work grew from 1,527 to 1,995. So that is a 30, almost 31% increase in just three years. Uh, meanwhile, at the same period of time over those three years, the number of lecturers fell by 17 if you look at a three campus net, but in fact, it fell much more in Flint and Dearborn. So while over 400 new people and the administrators were being added, the number of lecturers in Flint fell by 58 and in Dearborn by 31 as a result of record layoffs in those two campuses. And the only reason that the overall net was as small as 17, decline of 17, was that in most units in Ann Arbor grew in this period. And so the Ann Arbor growth mostly, but not completely offset the, dec the really dramatic declines that occurred in Flint and Dearborn. 58 and 31 may not seem like big numbers, um, but Flint and Dearborn are smaller campuses and don't have that many faculty. So we're talking about 58 or 31 out of a baseline of less than 300 lectures. So you can do the math in your head probably. And those are substantial layoffs. And they, and this is just a head count. These are, this, those layoffs, the 58 and 31 only measures those who went from having a job to having no job at all. A lot of additional lectures in Flint and Dearborn and some in Ann Arbor as well, but much more pronounced in Flint and Dearborn went from having maybe full-time to half-time or maybe three quarters time to one quarter time. And so that is not even counted in these lines. All we see here is the people who went from having some work to none at all. So they understate the decline in Flint and Dearborn and therefore overall. Here's one last look at another way of thinking about the comparison uh, between higher administration who are making more than 100,000 and all lectures. Here we see uh, the, the purple dots represent Ann Arbor, the red represents Flint and the yellow ones Dearborn. So there is actually at this point, circa uh, 2020, the same number of dots. There are the same number of lecturer faculty and higher admin people. Why then are these circles so much, one is so much bigger than the other because of the pay rates. So this, the, the overall, if you like, diameter of the two circles gives a measure of how much more the upper administration people are paid in, in a different uh, visual representation. Um, and clearly, that raises the question of why uh, top administrators are paid so much more than lecturers and why, given the vital work that lecturers do and its connection to bringing in resources and revenues into the university, the growth rate of higher admin should be so much higher, in fact, 30% over three years versus actual decline in the number of lectures. What's wrong with this picture? Um, what is it that higher admin contributes to the university that is so much more important than what lectures do to whether we're talking about the mission of education or whether we're talking about revenues, how is it that they are doing work that is three or four or many more times more valuable than what lecturers are doing. The standard answer to the question of why higher administration are paid so much more, not only in this university, but in comparable universities, is that, well, that's what the other comparable universities are doing. But really, that's not an answer at all. That's kind of a house of mirrors, really, where each one, each one of, let's say it's 15 that are in the pool of comparables, each one is looking at the other 14 and saying, well, they went up by 15% last year. We need to do the same. And you go around that, that circle of 15, each one is looking at the other 14 and they're all looking at each other and doing this, right? There's no, there's no foundation to that. There's no grounding to that. There's no ways. What is the output? What are these people actually doing? 
that generates the value that would justify that kind of increase. There, there is no, there's no, no, nothing of that sort is, is, is included in that kind of a comparison. What we really need, if we were going to assess the relative value of the work that we do and the, therefore the relative justice of these enormous uh, pay gaps, as well as the, the, the divergence of how many people are actually employed to do this work would be some measure of output and the value of that output. I, I look forward to a time when we will have that kind of a measure. Hopefully the university can generate some good data on that. So the, the gaps in pay that we've described thus far are plenty bad and unjust and need to change. In the last year, and particularly in Flint and Dearborn because of the layoffs that I just discussed, things are even worse because the faculty workloads have gone up dramatically. Now, part of that was because of COVID made all of us work harder, whether we were faculty or staff or administrators too. Everybody was working extra in order to be able to cope with the challenges of uh, changing the whole way we did our operations. But with that as a baseline, and of course, all of that increased work was uncompensated. We also had these layoffs, which we've done some calculations to say, when you, in, when you lay off partially or completely 41% of your Flint Lex and 34% of your Dearborn Lex, what is the impact of that on the workload of the people who remain? And the answer, because we can calculate, well, how many student credit hours were offered before this 41%, these declines, these cuts, and how much are offered afterwards? How many FTEs of faculty did we have for the tenure track and for the lectures before these cuts and how many afterwards? And what you see is that the a number of student credit hours taught per full-time equivalent, meaning per full-time faculty member, increased for the tenure track faculty, 39, almost 40% to 245 student credit hours per FTE. For lecturers, it went up significantly less, but still almost by a quarter. And it started from a higher baseline of higher number of student credit hours per FTE for lecturers than for tenure track. So even a smaller increase left our lecturers doing a lot more student credit hours per FTE than their tenure track counterparts. Um, now this is for Dearborn, we took that for an example, but. You know, the layoffs were even larger in Flint, and I would expect us to find an even stronger pattern there. So we were told uh, at the time of these layoffs that their primary reason had to do with declines in student enrollment. But if you were laying off faculty only in order to keep up with, if you like, decline student enrollment, if those were proportional, if, if you laid off the number of faculty that were proportional to the number of students you were losing, then the ratio, the student credit hours to FTE ratio would not increase like that. So what these numbers tell us is that, yes, there were student uh, enrollment declines stronger in Flint than uh, in the other two campuses, but in within certain units of Flint and Dearborn, there were declines in both, particularly in Cass and Castle. But these student declines were not nearly as large as the layoffs were. And that's why the people that were left behind continuing teaching suddenly saw their teaching load go, go way up. And of course, for the students that remained, what that means is that their class sizes went way up because the number of classes lecturers were teaching, four and four didn't change. The number of classes that the tenure track faculty in, in Flint and Dearborn are teaching, typically three and three, didn't change. What happened was the class sizes increased for the faculty of each kind. And probably, and you know, judging by this, increased a lot more for the tenure track than for the lectures. Quite possibly because the lectures do have a collective agreement. And that collective agreement says that increases in workload have to be negotiated. And that puts some constraints on the ability to unilaterally raise class sizes for lectures constraints that don't operate with the tenure track faculty that have no union and have no collective agreement. So bottom line, while higher administration positions were rapidly expanding, lecture positions were cut and both faculty workload and student class sizes increased. 
It's a good example of how our working conditions are our students' learning conditions, and also evidence that there was plenty of money to permit increases in uh, pay for lecturers and to keep class sizes where they were, but that that money was instead allocated to other purposes, among which were hiring a lot more administrative staff and of the most expensive kind, right, of the kind that are above $100,000. All right, now I want to talk about student funding uh, per FTE by campus, because we've just seen an example of how the layoffs in Flint and Dearborn, which didn't really have a major counterpart in Ann Arbor, increased student class sizes on those two campuses, making those students worse off than their Ann Arbor counterparts relative to that baseline before the layoffs. But here we want to look a lot more systematically at the level of support that students in these two camp on our three campuses get. So what you see uh, in this first column is just a, some sense of the number of students on each campus. You can see Ann Arbor is a much bigger campus. We transform those student uh, numbers, headcount, into FTEs, full-time equivalents of students, or full-time students, if you want to think about it that way, because although it doesn't make much difference in Ann Arbor, where most students are full-time, there's not much difference between a headcount and an FTE count in Dearborn and Flint, where a lot of more of our students have to work part-time in order to earn enough money to support themselves, and therefore can only take their courses at, at a part-time basis you know, there's a big gap between number, a head count and, and an FTE count for Flint and Dearborn. So to compare Ann Arbor to Flint and Dearborn, we have to take that into account. So we'll use FTEs as the denominator for three categories of funds that we spend on our students. The first is instruction, which means paying for the faculty, tenure track, lectures, and GSIs that a student you know, has access to in the course of a full-time student would get in the course of a year. And so that number is equal to about $25,000 worth of faculty time, if you like, per student, full-time student in Ann Arbor, and 10,000 and almost 11 and almost 12 in Dearborn and Flint, respectively. Then we look at student services or a variety of services that are provided to students and how much per student those services cost. And we see that in Ann Arbor, and these data are a little bit dated, 2016, uh, because they come from the federal government's Department of Education iPads data set, which lags by a couple of years. But these numbers won't be much different in, in 2020 from what you're seeing here in 2016. The gap between the level of student services provided for an Ann Arbor student compared with Flint and Dearborn is massive. And if we look at scholarships per student, also very, very large gap in the amounts that are paid. Total funding adds up these three columns and then divides by FTE. So you can see the bottom line is that our students in the current system that we have in Flint and Dearborn are only getting about a quarter of the amount of money that um, our students in Ann Arbor get. We think that's unjust. We think that's a reflection of a certain kind of classist and racist distinction that's baked into the way our campuses, the three campuses are funded right now, and that has to change. And part of our demands in this round of collective bargaining are for uh, the university central administration to provide $15 million more resources per to at Dearborn and to Flint per year over the next three years of the collective agreement so that these numbers can come up so that our own members can be paid on a parity basis, for at least at the minimum rate, uh, will be paid the same minimum on all three campuses, like we saw with those four universities that we looked at on an earlier slide. But also, so there'll be resources necessary to increase what is available for Flint and Dearborn students and others who work on those campuses. Now, we might say, okay, the current inequalities, whether we're looking across our campuses at lectures in Ann Arbor versus Flint and Dearborn, or whether we're looking across, you know, comparing U of M to other four-year universities or to community colleges, these are unjust. Uh, the way the students are treated so unequally is unjust. But not every university will be able to 
respond fully to those injustices if it hasn't got the resources to change it. You know, so we need to make the additional case, I think, that not only are these injustices that should be corrected, but that the University of Michigan has the resources to make those corrections and that it can do it now. It doesn't have to postpone this until some great fundraising campaign has succeeded or something of that nature. So these slides, the next three slides we're going to look at were generated by Howard Bunces, who is a faculty member, professor at uh, Eastern Michigan University's School of Business, accountant by training, but also critically for this purpose, he was the treasurer of the National American Association of University Professors for a number of years, during which time in that role, he went to many, many chapters, AAUP chapters across the country to help their affiliates, their chapters, you know, understand their budgets and understand their financial statements and basically be able to assess objectively how well are our universities doing. And so as a result of all that work that Bunces did, he became one of the most knowledgeable, if not maybe the leading sort of expert on university budgets and financial uh, structures in the country. We're, we're lucky to have him just a few miles down the road at EMU and in previous round of bargaining, he came and, and, and addressed lectures and developed uh, a lot of data that were highly relevant to our demands and our analysis and our demands both at that time. And here he's updated. He's not able to be with us at this round of bargaining because he's helping a whole bunch of other campuses, uh, other universities to, to do these kinds of analyses. But he provided these slides, so I'm going to run through the, what they basically mean uh, in his absence. So the first one we're looking at is excess cash flows. And what we're really doing here is these, these surpluses that are being summarized by these blue bars are in the millions of dollars. And the nature of this surplus is the following. Accountants like Howard do a, an analysis of what share of the university's total costs are what they call operating expenses. And so operating expenses would be the cost of things that they have to do in order to maintain their basic operations. So they have to pay DTE for whatever electricity DTE provides. They have to pay for whatever fuel they use. They have to pay for all of the inputs that keep the operation running in terms of food for the cafeterias, all of the labor costs uh, for essential work, like teaching that's essential to bringing in the revenues that we talked about, people working in the cafeteria, people cleaning the buildings, all of these are labor contracts that are essential to the basic operations of the university. So what they do is they calculate all of those, and then they look at the difference, if there is a difference, between those operating costs summed up and the total revenue stream that's coming in. Now, it's entirely possible that in some universities, you don't have much surplus. You have enough to meet your basic operating costs and not much more. But at the University of Michigan, that has not been the case for a very long time. We have been running big cash flow surpluses for years and years. We actually, we, we only show 2014 in this slide. We actually, Howard calculated it back to 2005 there was not a single year, even in the crisis of 2008-9, even in those bad years, we ran a surplus. And in these most recent years, you can see it's never been below $280 million per year. And it's got as high as, well, in, in 2020, in spite of the fact that three months of the 2020 fiscal year, fiscal year runs from July 1 through to June 30th, so the last three, March, April, May, June, last four uh, year, months of the 2020 fiscal year were impacted by COVID, our overall operating surplus was actually higher than average. So part of that has to do with operating costs that uh, went down because we weren't running things that we normally run because they were shut down under COVID. Part of it reflects federal money coming in that wouldn't normally come in, but came in from an emergency federal COVID relief, so our revenue stream was, was actually higher. We didn't reduce tuition, so our revenue stream from, and, and we didn't reduce the number of students, not by much, not in Ann Arbor at all, and not by much in Clinton-Dearborn. So our revenues actually were above normal, our costs were below normal, and so our operating surplus was actually greater than normal. 
main point though is that no matter how you slice it, we've been running major surpluses every year. We are not an impoverished institution by any stretch of the imagination. Now, it's important to say, to recognize that, you know, these surpluses we've been generating year after year are not really, they're not represented by so many gold bricks or stacks of bills sitting in the Fleming building somewhere in the basement or in the president's office or anywhere else. All of this money surplus above operating expenses is typically either spent on something or invested, like plowed back into uh, our investments along with the money from our endowment that we invest every year. So it's not sitting around waiting to be scooped up and used for a purpose like, you know, providing our Flint and Dearborn students with more money per student, more like what they get in Ann Arbor, or paying our faculty and staff better in Flint and Dearborn or all three campuses. But what is the case is that all of the money that's represented in these blue bars is money that we can spend on, on a discretionary basis. It's money that we decided to spend in the way that we did. We, we decided that the things that we would spend it on or the decision not to spend it, but instead plow it back into the stock market or other kinds of investments what was what we prioritized and what we valued. And that's really, we're gonna come back to that point. Let me move to the next slide. The concept here is unrestricted reserves. It's not an accident that when you run a surplus in terms of operating expenses every year in this period, you see unrestricted reserves also go up because what unrestricted reserves means is that unlike, let's say, in a lot of endowment money, not all endowment money, but a lot of it is donated by wealthy people who say, you know, you can you know, have this money, but only if you use it in the following way. And so that's restricted money. Um, that, that money would not show up in a measure of unrestricted reserves because its, its use is, is restricted by the conditions that were imposed by the donor. There are other kinds of restrictions also that are you know, all of those operating expenses as money that's committed through contracts. And that's a kind of restriction on how that money can be spent. It, you can't just violate those contracts, at least as this money is accounted for, it's assumed that you can't do that. And we don't do that at the University of Michigan. So unrestricted reserves is money which you acquired in a fashion, in a good deal of it acquired through these annual surpluses that means that there are no restrictions on it. You can spend it on whatever you want. And you can see back in 2008, 2009, from a top of 4 billion, we spent it down to 1.5 billion. That's a pretty major decline. Some combination of spending plus just not as much revenue coming in, okay? But then we built back up again to the point where we were all the way back by 2017 to where we had been before the crisis, the economic crisis hit. Since then, it's gone down a little bit. You can see in 2020, it went down some. It suggests we, we spent about, I think we did a calculation based on some university administration stats that suggested we spent down our unrestricted reserves by about 2% in order to deal with some of the challenges of the uh, COVID impact in 2020, fiscal year 2020. Again, the same message really as from the previous one, except now we're looking at the whole pool of unrestricted reserves, not just the, in the flow from a particular year, but the stock of money that we're free to spend in the way that we want to, it's massive. It's much, much higher than most other universities have. I was reading an article on Johns Hopkins the other day, uh, which is uh, trying to impose austerity measures on its faculty and the op overall operations. And um, they also did an analysis of their budget that showed that this austerity was really completely unnecessary. In the case of Johns Hopkins, they had half of what our unrestricted reserves are there. All right, the last slide from Howard Bunces shows kind of the consequence of these things. Um, because we have such a large endowment, over 12.5 billion, uh, the third highest of any public university. Um, because we have so much in unrestricted reserves, 3.1 billion, we have so much cash on hand, which is a somewhat different concept that we don't really need to go into right now. But these are, these are the kinds of things that bond rating agencies look at 
when they try to decide what rating to give universities or any other kind of organization that they're asked to rate, how safe is it to loan money to this institution? And so we at University of Michigan are just one of seven universities, public universities in the entire country that have the highest possible rating, AAA rating from both Standard & Poor and Moody's, two of the three big rating agencies over here in the bar graphs. That puts us in this AAA category. The deep blue color are the uh, private sector universities like the Yales and Harvards of the world. And the light blue are the publics. So there we are with the other six public universities. And let me note, not a single one of the universities in that earlier table that I showed you. Let's go back to that for just a second. All right, let's look at which universities were in that group that was paying so much more than the minimums that are being paid in University of Michigan. U UCAL, Fordham, Rutgers, Tufts, Chicago, the UMass system, Loyola, Penn State, all of those, all right? Remember those names that are paying more than us. Not a single one of them is in this group, in this bar here. These are the ones that are in that bar, Indiana, Purdue, Texas A&M, UT, Virginia, and North Carolina. So they have less resources to work with and they pay substantially more minimum than we do. That to me shows that any kind of protestations that Leo is demanding too much when we say our mins need to be raised up to 60,000 a year and that they need to be the same across all three campuses is baloney. Conclusion, U of M can afford to meet our salary demands and it ought to meet them. We acknowledge that U of M does not have an inexhaustible supply of money, but it is very strong financially. It's the burden of the last three slides from Bunces. Because our should be resources are finite, we have to set priorities based on our values. Even if we are wealthy, we must set priorities. Budgets are, in that sense, moral value expressing documents. And it's contrary to our values to pay so many lectures less than a living wage as defined by the United Way's survival budget for a family of four. It's contrary to our values to support rapid increases in higher administrative staff numbers and pay rates both, while faculty and lectures in particular are told to tighten their belts and work harder, and students are told to take on more student loan debt and accept larger class sizes, especially when faculty and students in Flint and Dearborn bear a disproportionate share of those burdens. This would be true even if the, fact, if the students of Flint and Dearborn came from the same kinds of families as the students in Ann Arbor, but of course we know that's not true. The students in Flint and Dearborn are much more likely to be from Michigan. They're much more likely to be from working class families that are sending their kids to college for the first time, first gen students. And they're much more likely to be people of color families. Um, so these inequalities would be unjust even if those things weren't true. But when you consider that they are also true, the injustice of those inequalities becomes much more substantial. So our salary demands aim to realign U of M's behavior with its values by changing salary and budget policies that have so far exacerbated income inequalities among U of M employees and among lecturers too as part of that and have reinforced the effects of society-wide long-term structural racism, and I will also say classism, by leaving more barriers in the way of students of color and working class students and offering them fewer resources with which to meet those challenges. That concludes our presentation. I'd like to acknowledge in closing people who have contributed to the gathering of the data, the analysis of the data, and the development of these slides. So I wanna thank Brenda Brown, Howard Bunces, Tyrese Denson, Deborah Desjardins, Alex Elkins, Brianna Foraker, Ardina Has Hasenbazari, Bob King, Bobby Matamanchi, Eric Marshall, Jennifer Miller, Matt Oakes, 
John O. Sturt, Stephen Toth, Joe Walls, and Isaac Winfield. Thank you.